So, Karen Wintrow doesn't need introduction, I don't think. Uh, well, uh, Karen Wintrow, I'm the director of the Yellow Springs Chamber. I always love coming and talking to you guys. It's uh, a lot of the old timers. Um, you guys kind of schooled me when uh, when I got to town and my, my years on council, so I really appreciate uh, being with you guys. So um, I think I did this last year at about the same time. So um, actually some of the slides will be a little bit of a repeat and um, the first part of the slides of the, of the presentation is just a little bit more about what the chamber does um, and how the chamber serves the community. So this is our mission, um, to encourage a vibrant business environment that drives the success of our members while enhancing the quality of life in our community. Uh, we recognize that in a community the size of Yellow Springs that we're as connected with the citizenry as we are with the, with the businesses. So we work to see how that can go together. And in the past few years, we've been working much harder to, to do community projects that benefit the village and benefit the citizens. Um, this is, so I'm just going to kind of go through the list and how we address some of the, the, these these areas. So the vibrant business environment. We um, we have a page on our website that first of all we have actually have two websites. We have a business website and we have a visitor website. So on this website at the bottom, those are all, all of the commercial properties that are available. So we work with property owners to make sure that we're listing and that these. Um, that people, if people come to visit our website, they're interested in opening a business in Yellow Springs, they know that these properties are available. And this is a brochure that we've developed that is focused on business development in Yellow Springs. Uh, one of our big things that you probably all know, and we just came off of it, is Street Fair. And we, we absolutely believe that Street Fair is contributing to that vibrant business environment. It is. Uh, an important day for two days uh, out of the year for our businesses and so um, and, and it brings a lot of visitors a lot of those visitors end up being residents or opening businesses in Yellow Springs so we, we have a lot of street fair vendors who have actually transitioned to be becoming bricks and mortar businesses in Yellow Springs so um, so for the chamber it is a huge financial it, it's a financially important event for us um, the vibrant business environment, these are pictures of our annual meeting. We have our annual meeting uh, in February. And for the first year this year, you see in the top uh, left picture, um, I'm presenting our um, impact award, village impact award to Rod and Ellen Hoover. This is the first year we've done awards. And it worked out great. We had two, our two winners were Millworks, Sam and Sandy, Sam Young and Sandy Love and Rod and Ellen Hoover won for Mill Works for Business and then we're also doing an award for nonprofit and the Little Art Theater uh, won the award for the nonprofit excellence. And then here you see um, Charlie, uh, the person on the left is Charlie Bachtel from Cresco Labs. So um, that is, Cresco Labs is certainly one of our uh, the highlights of my years in Yellow Springs and is certainly contributing to the to the business environment and to the vibrancy of Yellow Springs. Uh, drives a success, I don't know why I have that thing up there twice. Um, okay, we can go on. Drives a success. So um, part of what we do with driving the success of our members is providing them with tools. So one of the tools we have here that we've developed is a flow chart that um, helps them get through the process of zoning and building permits. Um, we find that that is incredibly complicated for a lot of people and I can't tell you how many projects have ground to a halt because people didn't understand that process. So we're here to connect, um, to, to be that liaison to, the village, to village government, to county government, to state government, whatever it might be, whether it be for permits, whether it be for funding, um, Josue and I just came from a meeting where we're connecting, um, working to connect a local business with funds for them to be able to do some business expansion. Um, and then on the right here, this is showing our business resources. So again, we have contacts. I was in a meeting on Monday 
with someone from Jobs Ohio, um, which is the state economic development organization. So our role is to help connect our businesses to resources that will help them in their business, be it educational resources, government resources, um, and, and we also uh, do events. We have monthly events. Chamber chats are typically educational in origin. Um, you see that um, this one happened to be about social media policy, which is um, certainly a hot topic in Yellow Springs. And I think this was right after there was a situation um, with the schools where there was some um, blowback about some social media posts um, that impacted the schools. So it was very timely. And then we also have Business After Hours, which is an opportunity for our members to um, bring people into their business, highlight their business. We just did one at Still Rights, which actually happens to be in Fairborn. Um, but uh, they are a member of the Yellow Springs Chamber, and we had a great turnout there. Um, and another thing enhances quality of life. Um, one of the big things we started about six years ago was our Yellow Springs Chamber Scholarship. Um, this year it went to Annalise Fisher, um, but it's, again, it's another way that we want to give back to the citizens. Uh, Shred It, uh, we had Shred It back on May 18th. Um, this year we had it at the Bryan Center, which was the perfect location. We're going to be doing it again at the Bryan Center. We have already have it scheduled for, I think, the last Saturday in April. We partnered with the Village for the location and also to work with the Environmental Commission to have them come and, uh, and help with uh, distributing recycling information. Um, <coughs> next. And uh, Pride is, is one of the events. Pride Weekend is coming up this weekend. We're one of the major sponsors of Pride. Again, it's a way to, uh, to show that quality of life, to show that acceptance and uh, what, a, what a welcoming community Ellis Springs is. Um, I'm going to deviate a little bit. I want to talk about the destination economy because it is a frequent topic of conversation in Yellow Springs for, for folks who, uh, who you know, may get a little annoyed at the visitors that come to Yellow Springs. Um, when the village was looking into the potential of charging um, organizations for events and for the services they provide. I did some, I wrote a report um, to, to determine um, what, how much money came from the destination economy. Now I will admit that this is, this is extrapolating numbers from uh, the state of Ohio tourism, so there isn't, there isn't a, a I didn't have somebody put together this report. I put together the report from details, and I actually brought copies of the report, which will give you a few more of the details of where I got the numbers. But what my determination is, is that four and a half million dollars annually is coming from people who stay overnight in Yellow Springs. And actually, with the lodging tax now, and with the, with the hotel where we know exactly how much lodging tax they're contributing and Airbnb platform so we know exactly how many people are renting out rooms that I feel pretty confident knowing how many overnight visitors we have so that's four and a half million dollars from overnight visitors and that includes that's that's not just for their lodging that's for their food that's for any other ancillary shopping that's an average and I took that average number from uh, Ohio Department of Tourism. And then the annual uh, day trip we're spending, I'm, I'm identifying it being about $11.5 million. Um, a lot of that came from Young's. I, I got Young's visitation numbers. I figure if only 10% of the people that go to Young's on an annual basis come to Yellow Springs, and spend $25, that's contributing, and, and that's the, the orange part, $3 million is what, is what I'm estimating. Um, and then the general visitors, 65% um, are coming from general visitors, and then a million coming from events, people that come to events. And then this gets a little bit more to, to the local impact about um, the businesses that are impacted by entertainment spending, and I did this based upon our membership 
um, the numbers of people in these categories in our membership. So certainly shopping is number one, food services are number two, and then or, or a, a second, but arts and culture is hugely impacted also in a positive way. And extrapolating numbers from our membership and the number of employees that, I, that we uh, are aware of that they have, I'm figuring 475 full-time, full and part-time employees bringing in almost $5 million in wages and contributing um, a little over $70,000 annually in income tax. So it is, an, it is an important industry. You know, that's not even getting into, um, into any other uh, net profits taxes or anything else that, um, that these businesses may be paying. So, I mentioned um, that we had our, our business after hours at Still Rights. That's part of, an, I'm calling it creating a destination. So, since we have so many, we have Yellow Springs Brewery. We already had, as members, we have Yellow Springs Brewery, s and Artisan Distillery. Um, Brandeberry Winery and um, with two other breweries open, one opened in Xenia, one opened in Springfield and there's another winery in Springfield, and, or excuse me, in Xenia and still writes, it just seemed like a natural destination for folks. So I created what, I'm, what we're calling the Handcrafted 68 it includes these seven, um, these seven locations, uh, breweries, wineries, and distilleries, and it includes Springfield, Yellow Springs, Fairborn, and Xenia. So we've been working on coordinating events. Um, actually, the three breweries um, and, the, and two of the two wineries collaborated on uh, the first ever um, beer garden, beer and wine garden at the Taste of Green County, which was quite successful for everyone. Next. Um, this is an old slide. This came from the Bowen study um, showing that happened, the housing study that they did, showing the number of people coming in and then going out. Um, so it, we have 1,200 people commuting into Yellow Springs. This was 2018, so it's not, it's not very old information. Almost 1,000 going out and about 400 working locally. So it just it shows some opportunities. It shows that um, that we are drawing. I think this. I think for housing, it's more significant because it's showing that we have 1,200 people coming into Yellow Springs that are potentially people who could who could live in Yellow Springs. Uh, these are our top 20 employers. It really hasn't changed much since last year, except we added Cresco Labs. Um, I think that they're. Hopefully, you know, maybe we'll, we'll start to see some business growth, but this, is, this has remained pretty constant for a while now. Um, Cresco Labs, we had our ribbon cutting in uh, October 8th of, of 2018. At that point, they had around 10 employees. Um, as of April, the middle of April in 2019, they were up to 54 employees. Incredible growth. We, that was one of the places uh, Sway and I were there at 9 o'clock this morning taking a tour and visiting with those folks. Their parking lot is already too small. They're talking about doing some temporary expansions. They've expanded their, their uh, greenhouses. They've added greenhouses. They're, they're working to get their production or their processing up and running. Um, they're actually talking about potential future growth. Um, and, and if they do get, when they, when they do the processing expansion, Will, they are anticipating growing up to about 100 or more employees. So um, I don't think we expected that within a year or less than a year. Um, we certainly did, and I don't think they did either. So that's just been an incredible, um, an incredible opportunity and an incredible success story. Uh, new business this year: uh, Rose and Sal Mercantile opened in the old center stage space, um, one of Bob's tenants. Um, they um, very similar business to the business that was there before, um, but but great folks, um, 
very active in town, very active in, in events and things like that. Next on. Uh, right next, almost next door to them is the Green Canteen. Uh, they had their ribbon cutting in April 20th this year, um, selling really healthy food. Great young couple who live in Yellow Springs who um, had a, have businesses, uh, Brussels Pretzels in Columbus and I believe Cincinnati, um, saw an opportunity here in Yellow Springs and I expect them to be doing even more in Yellow Springs. She uh, is actually the person who, with another friend of hers, who um, came up with the Porch Fest event um, and we actually had a meeting last night. That again is going to continue. So great young people that are coming to town. Uh, another business expansion, um, so House of Ohm um, took the Mark's old space, the old Rita Cass space. Uh, they've been there for about two years. Um, they've actually expanded now. They used to have merchandise in the large space. They decided, and, and Basho actually screen prints t-shirts and other kinds of things, and, and he has a small gift shop. They were in the basement of this space where Mark used to do all of his work mm -hmm. and they were down there doing that production but also with the retail space. You can imagine a basement is not a great place for a retail space so they decided to move into this space when it became available right across very near them right around the corner in King Yard and so they have a combined um, retail space and Anthony is still <coughs> doing his, his production down in the basement of the House of Ohm space. Uh, another new business this year, Yellow Springer Tees. They had their ribbon cutting in the uh, beginning of June of 2019. Um, Mark has been active trying. He, he was a, an employee <coughs> of LexisNexis. He's been trying to do his own thing for a long time, was working out of his house, and just has got big enough. Um, one of the reasons his business grew is because he's very active in the Buckeye Trail. This shop is actually a Buckeye Trail shop, the first ever Buckeye Trail shop. So he's producing almost all of their um, merchandise um, and selling it out of the shop. So he's, he's becoming a, a de facto um, second visitor center in downtown because he's so knowledgeable with the hikers, with the trails, and with the bike trails and the Buckeye Trail. Uh, a business expansion, this was actually, I showed you this last year, it was supposed to have happened this year, it didn't happen this year, but they're anticipating to start on this um, the end of this year, the um, Yellow Springs Brewery South House that will be going into the old village, or you no, know, the old bowling alley space uh, south of town. The one thing I will tell you is, is that this rendering shows the rooftop uh, patio. They're actually not going to be creating any outdoor spaces with this, and they're actually going to be doing production here. They're going to be doing their barrel aging at this facility along with using it for event space for larger events. Mm -hmm. Uh, something that we're excited about that's, that's on the horizon, um, if you know that uh, Millworks, as I mentioned the, the Hoovers and the Young Loves, um, they sold um, that complex to Jessica Yamamoto and Antonio Molina uh, the end of 2018. And Jessica and Antonio have um, some ideas of um, how they want that facility to, to move. This is a little bit of the rendering. Um, the, on the left you see um, some artist lofts, um, so they're looking at some artist live workspace. On the right is um, a hostel that they're hoping to build. So um, looking to move it in a little bit more, um, uh, I would say destination direction. Um, I'll, we'll get to the, a discussion about EnviroFlight in just a second. Um, it, that particular operation was, was kind of outgrowing that inner city um, kind of space. Um, this anyway. view is as if you were above Fairfield Pike? Um, well, no, there's the building. Well, okay, Fairfield Pike is over here to the right. So if you can see over to the left are the existing buildings. Okay. 
So, so, the, so the intent is that the artist lofts would bridge the space between um, the existing buildings and um, then the hostel would be on the end. So the bike paths along the bottom. Yes, okay. yes. And, and this, in, this is a little inset up on the top right corner is a little inset. It's not part of the plan. It's a little inset that shows what the plan view would look like. Uh, something that I'm asked about a lot, um, and I actually think I was asked about the last time I was here, was this idea of succession planning and what's going to happen as um, all of our business owners um, start to retire. And I just wanted to point out a couple um, that are that, that have happened. Um, one is ElectroShield, and they actually went through two succession plans because the first success succession plan was for Nick Eastman to, to come in and take over operations, which he did for a few years, and um, I think he decided that that wasn't his future. Um, so recently, ElectroShield was sold three employees, um, two longtime employees and one who's a relatively new employee. So that's exciting. Josue and I met with them a, a couple of days ago. So um, they are committed to Yellow Springs and are, um, I think, under the new ownership structure, they're, they're looking to, to just continue where they are, but I think that, that in the future they have some, some growth aspirations. Um, one of our retailers, Dark Star Books, um, Mary Alice Wilson, many of you may know, um, her daughter Kate has now taken over. I mean, Mary Alice will never let anybody take over completely, but um, Kate's doing an incredible job. Um, I'm seeing more and more um, of the shops being, being purchased, or, or at least the, the, the operators of the shops being young people. Um, and, and I think those, those transitions seem to be taking care of themselves. Go ahead, Don. Um, this shows development site, this shows the CBE. That's the Cresco facility, um, and I didn't have a better shot of the whole site. But you can see there's, there's perhaps three to four parcels that are still available at the CBE. That's really a huge focus. There's approximately 24 acres remaining to be developed. That's really a huge focus of, of where the village is and where the chamber is uh, moving forward and trying to attract business to Yellow Springs. Um, I mentioned EnviroFlight. We're trying to locate them there in, that, in, the, front, um, in the front parcel um, that's closest to the street. Um, we were a little bit late to the late to the game, but um, with the with the encouragement and the leadership of Lisa Abel, who is through um, the Yellow Springs Community Foundation, is helping to stand up the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation. Um, we had a meet and greet at EnviroFlight last Tuesday. Um, the people in the background. This is Liz. She's the president of EnviroFlight. And the folks in the background are all EnviroFlight employees, many of whom live locally. Um, we we brought in we brought we and we just had a conference call yesterday. We brought in a retention team that includes the Village of Yellow Springs, the Chamber, Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation, uh, Green County Department of Development, Dayton Development Coalition, Miller Valentine, who is a developer in Jobs Ohio. So we ha we very quickly assembled a team to work on how we keep this business in Yellow Springs. They won't be remaining, they, they have a two year lease that will, they have a lease that will run out in two years at the Millworks complex, but we're trying to locate them in a new facility over at the Center for Business, in, or at the CBE. Um, and the game changer is the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation. So um, it, it is, it is working through the legal process. It will be a 501c3. Um, we're working right now with an attorney. Um, it's, we all have a code of regulations. It's, it's, it's governance is um, governed by Ohio Revised Code Section 1724, and it's to advance the, the economic community and civic development of a community through projects that support community goals. Typically, it's, it's more based on business development. In Yellow Springs, our goals are a little different. 
um, we, we, uh, we do have housing goals, we have other goals, so um, I believe our CDC will be um, more broadly based and look at the potential of investment in housing, investment in business development, and investment in other types of entities. At this point, it includes Village of Yellow Springs. I mean, th this, the, these, the top five listed are the, the base um, governance structure. Village of Yellow Springs will have one, one to three, probably two to three members. Uh, the school district, uh, Miami Township, the chamber, Antioch College, and then there will be, um, I think at this point we're talking about perhaps four at-large positions that will come either from the business or the nonprofit community. So these are what we see as our major opportunities in 2019 and 2020. Um, the, the upper right is, um, it, I just wanted to have a visual there. It's just now a parking lot. It's a parking lot on, at, at Dayton and Railroad Street. Um, this was a project that was envisioned for that spot years ago that fell through, but it's a visual I had, so I include it. So, so the Dayton Railroad property, the CBE, and Miami Township Firehouse and Offices. Um, those are all three prime um, pieces of real estate that um, have great opportunity for focus, I think, moving forward. Um, and, and it's where I believe um, what I'm hearing from the village and, and certainly where the chamber is, that those are, are areas we're gonna focus finding some uh, positive future use that will bring business development, that will bring um, tax revenue and jobs to the village. That's it. Thank you very much. One of the things that we know about uh, the business aspect of the community is, in large measure, it's the heartbeat of the community. It's what not only serves the residents of Yellow Springs, but also encourages visitors um, and the like. And it's also a major job opportunity. Everybody knows that um, if we love Yellow Springs, we'd love to live in Yellow Springs, but the reality is that it's expensive and you need job opportunities. So as we move and develop and bring more businesses in, we give our residents opportunities for employment. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to have um, Karen come in and talk with us about what the Chamber is doing because they are again um, a major con contributor to uh, the development of the village. So, with that, I will be quiet. And questions, please. Anyone have? <clears throat> I have one. Um, oh, okay. go, go, go. Um, when I first came to Yellow Springs, I guess it was close to 50 years ago, many of the people who lived here were associated with Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And I noticed that we've almost broken total ties with the military, and yet that's the area that our current administration certainly seems to be growing more than anything else. Uh, has Yellow Springs become an artistic community rather than the, the defense community, or what's the chamber's position on that? Well, I spent a day last week at Springfield Air National Guard Base, and I have connections with Wright Pat, and we actually have a representative from Wright Pat on our board as an ex officio representative. So the chamber has certainly not cut ties with Wright Pat or with, with Springfield Air National Guard. We're actually looking to build those ties. Um, I, I think we do have, you know, I, I think housing is an issue. I think there aren't houses if, if people are stationed here. I got a ton of calls when, when the base realignment happened back in 2008 and, and Wright Pat expanded. Mark and I went down to um, San Antonio to encourage folks to move up to this region uh, and to Yellow Springs specifically, but there aren't houses. You know, they were looking for, folks were looking for rentals. I mean, some of these folks are, are just temporary, so they were looking for rentals. I think that's one of the reasons we don't have as many folks living in Yellow Springs from the base is that they're more, they tend to be more transient. But I do, I mean, I actually, I do feel like there, there are quite a few. Um, 
and I, and I got a lot of questions about the piece, the, the piece, um, uh, what am I, am I going blank? Oh, I mean, the, 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 on the corner, the Saturday, the, oh. the, place, the peace vigils on Saturday. You know, so, so people, I did get calls at that point. People were concerned about were they going to be welcome in Yellow Springs. And I said, yeah, you know, I said, said but be prepared to understand that there are people who don't necessarily believe in what you do. So just, you know, don't take everything too uh, personally. Uh, is there ever, uh, first of all, I, I, from Bob's point, I don't think there was ever really a lot of support uh, for the military in the sense that there was any effort to, to welcome them. But I spent my entire career as a defense contractor, essentially, and mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of other people in town who oh, I don't know what their numbers are there now. Are a lot. But has there ever been a, a plan to uh, a sort of welcoming committee or just, you know, a group of five or six people that, you know, you could call if some, you got a phone call like that that would uh, kind of for give any the layout kind of for, yeah. for, for people military connected, let's um, say, or, or a defense contractor that's moving to town. That, um, that we, I don't know uh, what we have in the way of businesses these days. We used to have a few with uh, military contracts. I worked at Web Associates uh, you know, and, for several yeah. years, and they were all military, pretty much. Uh, I think probably the only one, Anthrotech probably does, still does some, mm -hmm. um, they have contracts with the Army and with other with other organizations to do yeah. the, the biometric measuring. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I, I work with the predecessors. Um, What's defense finance? I don't know. I think it's I think it's a person. I think I it's I think it's I think it's a, a single person who may be some kind of a contractor. But no, I mean as far as a welcoming yeah. specifically, I mean we we struggle. I've, I've tried to work or a few organizations, the Human Relations uh, Commission in Yellow Springs has come to me, this idea of providing welcome packets and things like that to any new resident. And we always struggle. How do you find them? So, um, you know, I think we'd love to welcome anybody to Yellow Springs and do what we can to, to educate them about what we have here, but it's always tough it's often tough to find new res where they are and who they are. Um, so we're, we're looking for um, strategies to find them and, you know, could be through the utility office because um, most people, whether they rent or, or buy, are going to be paying utilities. What about going through the realtors? Um, well, I mean, that's, that's going to be limited to people who are purchasing homes, but certainly we could. And, and the realtors, you know, they keep a stock of information, you know, so they, they actually keep those, those things. I've made packets for them, but that's a good idea. I mean, that's probably something we could, we could beef up a little bit, too. I'm curious. Do you know anything about the, is it sound space that's right here on Dayton Street? Do you know anything about what's happening with that? I, I periodically I'll see a, I'll see a Me sign up. I, Denise, you, you may know more than I do. I've yeah. just had people that have contacted before. I know they were, when the uh, medical marijuana dispensary, they were looking at that as a possibility. Um, it's privately owned. And I just saw there Chris out there putting some things out. One thing I picked up. And, and I stopped and asked him if it was okay if I picked it up, and, and I asked him if it was sold yet. He said he thinks it's going to be sold really soon. Okay. And so he's cleaning it out now okay. to get it ready. So have you been contacted by anybody, yeah. Denise? Nope. Which is always, I mean, that's always important. Well, it's, it, yeah, and before you buy a property, it's actually probably a good idea to go talk to the zoning office and find out what the zoning is and, and if you want to change that zoning or whatever your business use is, you might want to make sure it's going to be, it's going to be allowed. I mean, that's a little bit of what happened with the uh, uh, Trail Town Brewery is, is um, a lack of understanding of the, re the whole regulatory process, um, and that's really slowed down that project from moving forward. Yeah, Dave. There were competing narratives about you know, the Millworks place and EnviroFlight, and what are the secret tales you can tell us about? Somebody being pushed out, or people who are looking to move? And they... uh, well, I, I think that it's, you know, it was certainly, um, it's certainly difficult when, when um, 
when there's a change of ownership. And, and to be quite honest, I mean, I think that, that communication with EnviroFlight, when, when Glenn Courtright sold the business, communication became very different. It, it went to a totally different corporate structure. You know, Glenn was, I, I saw Glenn practically every day. I hung out with Glenn, you know, and, and as did he with other people. So it, it was, it changed, that's when it changed. That's when the communication changed. And so um, them being in the situation of, of moving, um, there, a, a communication hadn't been established. I mean, they didn't reach out to the village to say, previously, prior to them going to zoning, they hadn't reached out to say, hey, what can we do here? And, and as I said, you know, the, the, the use there has really outgrown the fact that, I mean, the, it, it was very liberal zoning on, on Yellow Springs part to allow them there in the first place. A lot of communities probably wouldn't have allowed that kind of use. Um, something that you really, we, was experimental in some, in some respects. You know, there are some odors involved. There are trucks involved. There, it, it's a little bit heavier use than that residentially oriented space really can support. They're in three different buildings. They want to be in one building. They want to have everything close. So, so it's basically all just cobbled together for them right now. So it's not an ideal situation anyway. So I suspect that even without that ownership change, that they were going to be looking at a relocation. You know, they, they, they purchased, they, they, they have a production facility in Maysville, Kentucky. And that has been underway for over a year. They're, they're now getting close to being able to actually put product out of it. Um, and, and I don't know why Ohio lost out on that, except I actually did find out at the meet and greet that the two parent companies are Darling Enterprises and Intrexon, and I believe Darling has facilities already in Maysville. So that decision was that decision happened at a level that we couldn't have impacted. Um, and actually, their Maysville is one of the locations they're looking at right now to relocate their R&D facility. What they what what they plan to do is to once the production um, comes up to speed in, in Maysville, they're still producing out of a local plant. They're going to convert locally, or they're going to convert this facility, these people, into R and D only. There won't be any more production happening. Um, so that that R and D can happen in Yellow Springs, we hope, or it could happen. They're talking to Maysville, and they're talking to Raleigh, North Carolina. Unfortunately, the president of the company and the second in command both live in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we're we're in in some you know in a bit of a Probably not an advantageous situation. They already found out they they can get six hundred thousand dollars in incentives from Maysville and three hundred thousand from Raleigh. Um, but I do think they were very impressed, and I think that they were very overwhelmed by the response from the community. There were a lot of people at the meet and greet, and as I said, we we very quickly brought the the economic development forces to bear. To, to see how we can get them into this building, how we can get a building built. Um, having Miller Valentine at the table who can actually build that building and own that building and lease it back to them is, is terrific. That would be built out here. Yes, it would be built, yes. Um, this is, I'm not too familiar with all this stuff, but I just have a quick question. To go off of um, bringing more business in and affordable housing, is there somewhere in your plan to where, because I live in Urbana, and people from Urbana always come here and we go to little shops. And so, is there like more of an opportunity to where it'll be affordable to have your business, to open up a shop, or to rent out a um, place to, so you can bring in more business and then bring in more employees and then bring in more people outside of Yale Springs? You know what I'm saying? I mean, to, for people to come here right. and open a business? Right, because like in Urbana, I feel like, the downtown, the square, they're trying to be more like Yale Springs, where all these little shops and little eateries and local businesses to support local business since that's being more popular. So I didn't know if you were devising a plan to go along with affordable housing but also affordable 
business? Well, actually, it's, it's more affordable to do. Business rentals are more affordable in Yellow Springs than housing is. So mm -hmm. thanks to Bob and, and, you know, and other, other landlords, other building owners, it's actually relatively, it's not that expensive to, to rent <laughs> in Yellow Springs. Um, but the bigger problem we have is that there is no space. We do not have a single open space in downtown Yellow Springs right now. Um, that's why we, I, I've identified um, a building at, where, in what is now a parking lot at the corner of Railroad Street and Dayton Street as a prime development location and the firehouse um, when they're able to get their new building built and, and that will leave a prime piece of real estate. So um, we're, we're really, we're landlocked to, a, to an extent because of the size of the central business district and, and I think what, we're, what, is, what the new owners of Millworks are looking at could potentially bring, um, they're looking at this idea of a maker space. So they don't want strict retail. So they don't, they don't want there to be a, a shop there. They want like the artist loft. So they want people to be making things and then selling them there. And so this idea of the brewery, that's what the brewery's doing. They're brewing beer and they're selling it. So, um, so that's another way to kind of extend that, um, that business opportunity to that area. And that's one of the reasons, you know, as, Viro, as EnviroFlight transitions out, there will be more space available there for that. Can I go through the Red Book business section? Uh, that is the phone book. Uh, I get the impression that there are a lot of businesses in town that I've never heard of, and they're somebody running a consulting business or a uh, website design or a freelance writer working from home. Uh, somewhere I came up with a figure of about 200. How do we foster that, quite, quite apart from whether that number is accurate? How do we encourage people doing that? How do we help them? And then also maybe how do we make it easy for them to report their income? Yeah, that would be nice. Um, I mean, I think one of the ways we've, we've made it easier is through zoning, and, and um, uh, it is easier, and maybe I'll ask Denise to address that, but um, Zine Avenue and, and Dayton Street, I believe the full extent of both of those streets, any of those residences can easily, is their zone to have business, right? Professional offices, yes. Professional, okay. Um, and I think even home businesses are... Home businesses um, can go anywhere. Right. Um, but there are restrictions. Uh, if it's a home business, like you mentioned, a computer web manager, creator, who isn't having um, visitors coming to the house, that's just a simple, a permitted home occupation. If it is something where they're gonna actually have visitors, um, then they have to go through a conditional use hearing because we wanna notify the neighbors and um, put an ad in the paper for the sign out, make sure that people can be heard and any additional conditions can be put on that uh, business if need be. But we do encourage. I mean, you know, I, I, it's, it's, and you know, for us, for the chamber, unless they, they join, it's tough for, for me to know who all is out there. But we certainly encourage it. You know, and then we, we have folks like Mark Heiss, who was doing this printing in production in his house, and he's now has a bricks and mortar business. And that's, you know, that's ultimately what we're looking for, too. Yeah. Uh, Yellow Springs is really in a big, terrible bind in our zeal to be environmentally perfect. We have surrounded ourselves with conservation easements and there is no place to build. We, we can either infill, uh, destroy older houses, or go up. But so housing is always going to be critical. And the people moving into town, they don't work in town. They work in Dayton. They, they, they have high priced jobs. They're paying the price. They don't care what the housing price is. They want to live in Yellow Springs. So we are becoming a two-class society, whether we like it or not. The people that have reached a high level of economic success, and at the other end, the people that have not. And we're getting 
the middle class squeeze is going to change drastically in the next 10 years. What we have to do is, uh, number one, we have to push the destination place, which we're doing quite well. But the fact we have just one public restroom just gripes me no end. The fact we have no parking is my second biggest gripe. Number three, it's got nothing to do with the town. We've had an out of control police force for 10 years and we are finally attacking that problem in the form of a more well-balanced community policing. What we've got to do is hope that Antioch College can survive. We had 2,300 students in 1973. And now I think we have 80. They cannot survive with 80, but there's so much talent there. There's so much history there. The first Little Ross College, west of the Alleghenies, the many women and blacks, they are known all over the country. The farther away you get from Al Springs, the better the reputation. But Antioch still has that legacy, still has that history. This town has to figure out a way to get behind Antioch's heritage. When I was there for three years, it was a magical place. They forgot what standards were, but they can get that magic back if they get there. But it's going to take the whole town talking about Antioch, uh, visiting Antioch, make it, make it work. And, and on the side, they are probably the largest landowner in Yellow Spring. When you look around at the golf course and at the dorms and what they have here and what they have there on the golf course, which I'm all for the solar field, but that only took maybe 15% of the golf course. The potential Antioch, we have to help blossom again. But we have to understand we're becoming an Oakwood, a small town Oakwood, it's not going to change. It will change. We've all got to work to make it more human, more caring, continue the things that have made Antioch, a, I mean, Yellowstone, a wonderful place to live. But it's going to be changed. It's going to be pressures are coming to change that. And so all of us here have to work individually or together in groups to make sure that this oasis in southwestern Ohio remains what our heritage has brought it to, and that's going to—it's it's not going to be easy. And I congratulate Chamber for bringing two businesses. I never thought they, i never thought you'd bring another business like Dayton Mailing to Yellowstone. And I'm guessing they have 60, 70 jobs. I'm not sure. And Cresco, uh, someone went out and saw a a need and saw something we could do. Uh, it, it's a plus. Yeah. But to make this a real tourist town, we've got to figure out a way to wage, raise the wages downtown. We're still talking eight bucks an hour. Come on, guys, eight fifty, nine bucks an hour. It, we, we've got to raise that up now. When Walmart is talking ten bucks an hour, it might happen. When Target is talking fifteen bucks an hour, come uh, probably two thousand and twenty-one. Uh, that minimum wage has to come up. When the Democrats take over in the fall, they're going to push the minimum wage up. So good things can happen, but everybody, everybody's going to have to work harder and work together to make this town survive. And that's well, for Christ's sake, get some restrooms downtown. <laughs> that's it. The village, that's actually on one of their priority lists. That is, that is in a plan. That well, is being I know, discussed. we've had a plan for years. I know, but there's still so, this one. So, back to, the, yeah, back to the Antioch <laughs> situation. Having a village manager who has an Antioch, a strong Antioch connection, I don't think we've had that since, uh, well, Bruce, obviously, and then David Heckler. David Heckler, grad, I think, didn't even. Well, he did take yeah. some classes. He did go to, to yeah. take. So we haven't had a village manager since David Heffler that had a connection to Antioch College. So I think Josue is going to make all the difference in the world. Of, of it, it's, it's not just the connections. It's understanding. It's understanding what the opportunities are, and it's understanding what the history of the college is. So that excites me um, a lot. I mean, we the past two weeks since... Um, Josue started last Monday, and he and I have been on, what, five business visits. We've walked through downtown, 
So he is really throwing himself into understanding the, the business environment here in Yellow Springs, and I think that that's going to be very meaningful. We've had great conversations. We actually just came from DMS also. So we've had great conversations with the business community and how the village and the chamber can support them. So, so have we thought about looking at what other villages have done? There are so many small colleges just in Ohio. How do, how do, do they get along with their community? How do they have mutual agreements and keep the colleges? Look at Kenyon College or Oberlin. I mean, there's just so many colleges just in Ohio, not to mention the other parts of the country. Right, right. I, th I think we have to look at all the strategies that we can execute to meet a lot of the challenges that we have. So there's a demand for workforce housing. You know, there's folks in town that have employees that can't afford to live in the town that they work in. So we need to, we need to promote um, development projects that can make housing units available for that that population. Um, there is a challenge with the middle class. I think Bob, and Bob stated it well, that you have this demand on both ends and there's so much in between. So that's from the, from the housing perspective that it would also influence the economic development activities. If we have workers here that can, uh, that can be attractive to employers, that's, that's gonna help us in the, long, in the long run. I think there's also a, a amenities and housing that we could that we can work towards to have to attract the right talent. I think they're looking at the jobs list, you know, that you, there's a lot of different talent demands all across those jobs. So we need to be attractive to businesses um, from a talent pool. Uh, for the Antioch, one of the things that I've looked at is what was the impact of Antioch closing most recently? There was some impact, but it was not detrimental to Yellow Springs. So that's an indication that Yellow Springs on its own is a strong and vibrant community that, that was able to sustain itself with the closing of the college. Now, there's also a lot of opportunity um, to, with Antioch that we could help address some of the, the issues that we want to address. Mm -hmm. An example that I've heard, I, I heard about Antioch Village, and folks were put, willing to put money down into the project to make it happen. And that, to me, that's an indicator, do you have a viable project? There's folks that are willing to put money down on just a concept. And so to me, that's an indicator that there's some strong interest there um, to, to work on that. There's also an opportunity around, around the, the or, or elders in the community that may be looking uh, to, to, to reduce their footprint, move into a, a, a single floor, smaller home, and are those opportunities available in town for them to transition out of their homes into smaller spaces that are more conducive to aging in place. And then that could create opportunities in the housing stock. We will have some housing stock that may become available for development opportunities or to attract this middle class growing families that could be very helpful to, to the community. So I think there's a mix, there, there's a, there, there's no one strategy to look at. We need to look at all the opportunities available and how do we create synergies between those uh, between the initiatives and projects to have a multiplier effect on right. all the challenges Basically, that we it's have. A system. Right, it is it's a system. system. You no. can't fix this part unless you fix every yeah. part that comes before. Absolutely, it, absolutely. It's a and, it, and, and a lot of it, right. and a lot of things that we're talking about is what are the outcomes? What are the outputs? What are we gonna? We're gonna. What, what can we deliver for the community? There's also a layer beneath that that it is our infrastructure. You know, what, one of the challenges I. I we were investing with a, with a business earlier is about surges, and they have highly sensitive equipment that a microsecond surge is affecting their, their production. And so those are things that, that from an infrastructure perspective, we, we need to look at. There's broadband uh, connectivity that, that we need to look at, and so, yes, we need to take a systems approach. Um, but your question is, are we looking at um, other small villages that... Well, no, I, 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 let me rephrase that. I, I mean, I just come from an environment where we do a lot, where we did a lot of talking to other companies or other, I come from Annapolis, mm -hmm. where we, they went out and they looked at, uh, you know, different cities. How did they change the landscape? How did they utilize their waterfront? 
Dayton did the same thing with their riverscape. So I'm just saying, you know, send a group of people out to some of the colleges whose uh, ecosystem mirrors ours and say, hey, how did you guys deal with this? Right. Just, get, just get ideas. It's not going to be the solution, but it gives you green hat thinking. Right. It gives right. you the opportunity to throw ideas on the table. Right, right. And there's two things to that, I think, mm -hmm. that we have to understand what role we play in the, in the local market and in the regional market. Mm -hmm. We have some good data that we're a destination site, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity there, a lot of opportunity not just for local businesses, but for also to develop a community. So understanding what role we play in the local economy and identifying what opportunities or available within that, and do we have the right resources? And the right, right resources are, are multiple. Do we have the land and the appropriate land to be able to deliver on some of those uh, initiatives or opportunities? Do we have the right resources, whether they're financial, the people, and, and so on? And so, you know, I think that there's a, some effort that I'm devoting all my time to un better understanding what role we play in the local ecosystem right. and where those opportunities are. Um, the the second part relates to this business uh, strategy. Uh, from a business strategy as a, as a village, you know, I was I had a, an opportunity to meet with with someone earlier over the last week or so that they attended a business conference on revitalization of small towns, and the facilitator asked, "Can you think of a place that you've been to that you would like to replicate that in your towns?" And the folks said Yellow Springs. You, Sophie, you said Urbana is trying to look more like Yellow Springs. And I think a lot of folks um, in the region will find a lot of value in Yellow Springs and they want their communities to look a lot more uh, like them. So that to me indicates that we had a good business strategy in place, that it's working. Whether it's intentional or just organic, we're doing something well. And so how do we keep doing what we're doing well, work on the things that we're working on, and you know, find new opportunities? And that's a great idea, and, and I, I'm excited that people, I mean, I came here for a purpose. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm anywhere, I mean, right? And that's what people see. They come here, and they see the businesses, and it's like going to Disneyland, you know? <laughs> Everything is happy. Mm -hmm. But what they don't see until you move here, or try to move here, is, you know, we're not Disneyland. So, my... I'm here because I like to see a stronger connection between the business <coughs> and the residents. And maybe it exists and I just don't know yeah, if it exists yeah. already. Well, but to, to kind of preserve what we have. Yeah. I, I think the support, the support of local business is really strong. I mean, Tom's, the pharmacy, those core downtown businesses, we have really strong support locally. Um, although I don't even believe those businesses would exist without the community. without visitor traffic that they undoubtedly get. Absolutely. Um, so I think that that's, that that's happening. I mean, every place that Josue and I have been visiting, there have been employees looking to live, looking to move to Yellow Springs, and they can't find <coughs> real estate. And, and, you know, you have to be, with the limited <coughs> real estate and the sometimes challenging real estate we have here, you have to be really committed to the idea of, of living in this community to make what in some some people would consider to be a sacrifice either by how much you're spending or that you're getting um, a lesser product than you might in another community and and you know people are coming from he's coming from DC so the commute the, the, the commute is nothing you know a 15 minute commute from Beaver Creek to Yellow Springs is nothing um, compared to most, what most people are used to. So, I mean, I, I, when it comes to those kinds of, I, I think housing is probably, is, is a huge challenge, but then, but then the other challenge is, is that, that it's that business growth that will help to support the, the citizenry, that will bring in the tax dollars, the real estate and the income tax dollars that will help to um, offset the costs on, on the residents. So we obviously need both of them. Mm -hmm. Is that she accurate? 383 work work locally based? Is that That's it? that was from Bowen. Okay. Um, and it says you say live and work here? Pardon? Do you say live and work here? Yeah. 
Pardon? 383 live and work here. Yes. 1206 come in to work here. Yes. 988 leave to work elsewhere. Yes. Right. But I thought that we had like a previous one that said that we only had like 400 and something jobs. That was <coughs> puzzling to me too. Yeah. Wasn't there a previous slide that said that there was only like 400 475 employees on employee this slide? Jobs. Well, it's not true. Uh, I think right. that, that referred to a tourist. Yeah, that was a tourist thing. I'm not sure that that that's the 383 seems honestly seems really low. Do you remember where well, that came from? 383 that actually live here and work here is what that, that's how I'm reading that. Mm -hmm. Is there has right. there been any part of a of a study that shows what our average salary is here in Yellow Springs? How much are people making? Um, I mean, that would very easily be able to tell have, you. Yeah, there haven't been any studies of any kind in a long time. We, the, we, could, the, we could calculate that backwards from the payroll, payroll taxes. Well, yes, like but there also case. there also is a number that aren't aren't being paid yeah. utilizing payroll taxes. Yeah, so that, that's that that's something that needs that to be, be addressed. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited about the next census. I mean, <coughs> if you look at the story of Yellow Springs. You know, back in the 1970s, we were there was a big fear that we were going to be 10,000 population uh, overnight, and and there were very strong uh, zoning restrictions put in place that pretty much just stopped growth. Um, and in the, in 2000, and it's taken until 2013 to actually redo the zoning code and to completely go in the opposite direction because as a result of that no growth. We just didn't have anything happening. Mm -hmm. Then you then you add on the loss of the Brene Labs and the YSI had reduced down and the, the, these things we kept getting hit with some things. Well, why, why is why is that never reduced? They they went to be recreated for a portion of time. Yeah, when I started but they sold that business. When I started in '87, there were 400 employees, and when I left in 2001, there were about half. They, they, yeah, they, okay, they, well, I never a, knew they a, a portion of them went to Beaver Creek. But what I'm saying is it's taken this period of time, and now, you know, since the new zoning code's in place, and I have to say over the last five years, we're seeing a complete change. I mean, look at what's happened. We have uh, we have DMS in here. We've got Cresco. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I'm, I'm in conversations all the time. Um, with the, the, the tracts of land that are still in the village that are left here for development, especially housing. I mean, things are happening, and, and we've, we've not only took that zoning code, but we've even loosened it up even more to allow for some other new concepts with infill housing. So, I, I mean, it's, it can't happen overnight, but it's definitely in a, in a, in a completely different reversal mm -hmm. and it's going in that direction that we want it to and <clears throat> I'm excited about what the next five years are going to bring. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I Do you know what it is? It's frequently politically in the way and it, get, it has an effect on the kind of things that you're talking about doing but I think it needs to be a much better definition of words that get thrown around a lot like affordability, diversity, and sustainability because those are clubs that are used to say this is <coughs> or we need more of this and that's way too vague. Mm -hmm. Defining what's meant, but more specifically, perhaps what isn't meant, mm -hmm. and what some, putting some realistic limitations on what can be done uh, is important for moving the discussion along. I mean, adding another five or ten more expensive, you know, sustainable housing units for people who have three hundred thousand dollars is not going to mm -hmm. add to affordability. It just add five more houses and. For, for people who are using money. fewer utilities because they're energy efficient. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think. Or they don't have kids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So they have more Yeah. Well, but it's also finding the, the right balance. You know, we need. We, I think that we we can create opportunities for those that are can spend three hundred thousand and up, uh, and and but also addressing the other needs. And the three hundred thousand, those that are paying more. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an additional resource. If they don't have kids, they're also helping offset the school district expense. Mm -hmm. And I think we want some of those residents that can help contribute to other systems, like the, the school system that they're not using, mm -hmm. so that we continue to have strong school systems that are uh, providing the service that other folks move into the community for. And our nonprofit system, our philanthropic system, I mean, that you need people at that high end also that are going to support our philanthropy. But I don't think anybody's saying, don't do any of that, just do this. Right. I mean, that's not what I'm hearing. I'm not I'm interpreting hearing a balanced approach. 
Is there any way you could look back and say over the last five years or 10 years, the kind of housing that has been created and produced so that we know if it's balanced or if it's not balanced? I mean, well, is there any historical? I, I think that there are things that we could look at now that are future looking. So there's a housing assessment that has some numbers put onto a, a demand. What, what's on the demand side of things? There's, I read, I, read, I read something in the report that said 300, up to 300 rental units. Um, so we know that there's that demand now. If we build them, this they'll will, come. They'll come right? <laughs> or they're already here. Right. They're, they're already are. here, and then we just can, can um, cut the loss of people leaving and whatnot. I know that when I came to, to Yellow Springs for my interview over a month ago, I, I met a business owner and said, one of my employees, one of my best employees, is moving out this week because she can't afford to live here. You know, that's how, that was a reality for him, and he made it a point to tell me that that we need housing at that level. So, you no, know, the demand there's there's enough there from the anecdotal information and data to say that we need more rental housing. So, you know, we can look at what's been built over the, over the years and do that analysis. But we know we have this demand right now, and the demand should influence the supply. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think that, that what has been built, though, and I mean, I'm just going by memory, has tended to be at the higher end, mm -hmm. or, or home, you know, homing's been building. I wouldn't say that it's at the lower end, but it's for, you know, it's for, it's for, it's, it's um, subsidized. And, but, but most of the other housing has been at the higher end in Birch 3, and there's been some infill, but those have all been higher, more expensive houses. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it's that middle range when you when when a lot. I mean, I just heard a lot sold for hundred and four thousand dollars. When a lot starts at hundred and four thousand dollars, you're not going to put a two hundred thousand dollar house on it. So, uh, the price of, of just the ground is establishing those those costs, establishing what people are investing. Who can afford to buy a hundred thousand dollar lot? Mitzi's been trying to. Say I, I have been trying to say something. You know, we have um, home ink and affordable housing, we have the higher end, you're right, it's the middle. It's the middle portion, and how do we uh, provide the housing for them, if that means uh, downsizing for our seniors or um, mid-range homeowners or people who want to live here, we have to address that as well. It can't be one or the other because those are the people um, in the middle who are looking still for housing, but can't find anything. So we, we need to make sure that if we have land available, that we're not shutting one party out, so. And you make a good point. The middle, from my understanding, is 65,000 area medium income. Mm -hmm. That's the middle. And so what kind of mortgage does that individual or family can support. So you currently, what's what I see in the market, and I'm in the market right. to, to find a, a house for my family. Yeah, that's, that, that is, that, at that income, it's, there are very few things that are on the market for that household. And so maybe the product that developers are delivering in, they're delivering in the community is just not suitable. Maybe a family, single family, housing isn't suitable, then we need to look at how do we build something with a lower price point, and we may, we're we going into that multifamily uh, development. I, I think about when I was in education and I was in Fairborn, and it was, you know, just those small, little, I would say probably, um, I'm not even sure how to explain the house, but I can remember in the school I was in, but the housing area, you know, these were just little, like, garage houses. Oh, which you know? we have a, actually a lot of them here in Yellow yeah, Springs. Yes, they just... But that is different. the, you know, maybe that's the direction we need to take. The other thing I think, you know, I agree about working to keep the college, but I also think there's an opportunity there with land, them selling off land, and possibly building um, senior Leasing. housing. What? Well, they're planning to lease land. Right. Lease land. I, I see they, they, they believe that 
the, the land itself is one of their biggest assets. Right. And it is. And it is. And it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's there. Antioch, yes. One, one of the things um, uh, we at the village have, have seen uh, is that uh, with, because of the high cost of land, um, you're not going to be able to find a developer um, that's going to want to come in and, and then build these uh, middle range homes. Right. So um, one of the things that we uh, at the village staff and uh, uh, council have been discussing are um, in, it's like an incentive based uh, where they can get higher density um, on that land, but typically they wouldn't. Um, but but based on the fact that they will get this higher density if they build homes within that range. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, so uh, uh, we'll have to have some sort of memorandum of understanding right. uh, between the village and, and the developer, as well as trying to do some more creative um, infrastructure um, rather than throwing everything in underground piping and, you know, getting back to the way we used to do with swales and um, channeling the, the water to another location, that which are all things that impact the developer's cost and can lower that. I mean, so those conversations, I just want to let you know, are happening right now because we, we, we realize at the village um, that we there's only a few more main, larger pieces of property left. Very good. Very good. Should start to I think so. I think so. Well, we certainly want to thank you, Karen. I know you have it extremely busy, and we are delighted, Josue, that you are with us. Hope you both, you know, feel free. You always have an open invitation to come back at any time. And we just again want to thank you. So